everyone. We're back with another episode of the Simply Trade News Roundup. Today, we have some really interesting articles for you um, with one main event that happened over the week. This week, actually. Well, because we're, we're still on the last week when we're recording it. Anyways, on this day when you might be listening to it, might be Easter, correct? Easter Monday? I don't know. I got I get the holidays all mixed up because here we have like three days of Easter, Sunday, Monday, Friday. I don't know. It's weird. And then in the United States, it might be different. Anywho, happy Easter for those who celebrate. Hi, Andy and Lalo. How are you guys? Doing good. Good morning. Awesome. Well, it's a beautiful spring morning with lots of rain for me. But I know for you guys, it might be different. You might have a blue sky, which sounds pretty nice. Oh, listen, it's a, this is a beautiful spring morning in, in Memphis, as I would say. It makes you as giddy as a filly on a spring morning. Well, <laughs> good one. Well, so with our first article, we're springing it back. We're bringing back some themes in here. We're springing it back. It's kind of a tragic art- article, though, because this week we had a tragic event happening, and it's still kind of... Everything is kind of still happening and we're getting more evidence while this event is turning out. But you probably know we're talking about the Baltimore Bridge, which is the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. And it is actually one of the busiest ports there in the United States, which is intense. And that bridge is huge. I mean, if you haven't seen the video by now, uh, maybe we can link it and you can watch the video because it's, I mean, it it's crazy. and. Well, a huge, what is it called? One of those ships, container ship, hit it. And there's been lots of articles around it because the story is still developing. Not sure what exactly happened right now. We're at a stand where it lost energy and so they couldn't control the ship. But let's talk on it because as this happened for people working in the supply chain industry or, you know, in logistics in general, they kind of had to turn on the switch because the port is enclosed. Shipments might not get through. Your shipments might be on that ship that's going to be stuck there for a long time. Your shipments might even be in the water. They might, you know, be ruined. Your customers are waiting for those goods. So what do you do? Or what should people in that position, you know, when you're, and I know it's been a few days now, but as this is happening, what do people in this industry have to do to, you know, stay, how how would you say it, have all, you know, have all their goods recovered and be okay with theirs in their supply, supply chain? What are you guys' first initial thoughts on this? Well, I, let me just jump in. I, I, in when, first off, this is a catastrophic event for the, the ship in that area. In the midst of that, <clears throat> the, you know, people are saying, well, I got to get my goods or I need to do this or that. You know, you just got to stand down. You don't have any choice in this. Physically getting your goods and rewriting them to a different carrier or something, that's anything that's on that particular ship is going to be tied up for at least a month. <clears throat> now, that said, if there are people that are involved in this, you start doing the planning. You might as well go ahead and plan on replacing the commodity or replacing the shipment and and get that underway because that's it, it, unless you can withstand a, at least a thirty day delay. The other thing is is you start looking at your marine insurance and all that. We're going to be having a show talking specifically about marine insurance cargo insurance, things of that nature with some folks from the insurance, uh, the insurance and surety industry, because you, you know, this is some of the things you need to look at the case in point with the, also the, your, your com- contract commitments and all is that you look at your deadlines, what you're being held to uh, as far as, you know, in this particular case, are you going to be able to meet your deadlines and at this point, you, you're not. So it's like, what are your fallback? What are your repercussions? What are you, are there any contractual penalties that you are going to have to pay? Or is this something that you can be able to, you know, take the, there's usually ex- exceptions in the 
statements in the contract. So that's one of the things that come into play here. And you'll have to exercise that. The other thing, though, then is longer term. All right. Yeah. You know, supply chain is going to be disrupted again, out of, in and out of the Baltimore port. So looking at it, you know, the other ports are going to start experiencing a bit more congestion as that volume starts being moved to other ports as far as imports and exports. And that also means <clears throat> rail in and out of those other ports are probably going to be a bit more congested. And trucking. So that's one of the things that's going to be coming out of this is that there's some definitely short-term opportunities. I hate to say it that way. In some of the other ports, there's going to be a, a huge demand for more truckers, more equipment, more, you know, containers, if you will, and chassis to, to move those containers in the other ports. So there's They'll get the port open just as quickly as they can, but just understand for the short term, you're going to have some, you know, fallback situations. And then you start looking at diversifying your, this is why it's good to diversify your supply chain so that you're not always, you know, contingent on one particular area or whatever, so that you can, you know, look at multiple areas. But most of this probably within 60 days. You know, I, I expect them to open up the port within 30 days with the cranes and, and all that, maybe within only a couple of weeks. Yeah, it's I that, the, that chassis. I thought I saw an article that said of, months. Well, it'll take months said, to rebuild the the bridge. My suspicion is they they're going to be the trying port? to open up the channel because you've got other ships that are in that channel just to get those ships out of that channel. Uh, you know, okay, it, yeah. that would be one thing. So we'll see what happens now. Will it be open for full business? No, it's, I think there'll be some traffic going in and out, but you know, again, that's one of those, we just have to wait and see. Yeah. Also something, I mean, these, these companies or a business is whatever logistics companies, they're losing money, right? What? Like well, it's going to raise costs on this, is that logistics. I mean, here, here, all right. So you put, these containers but are like what are they going to do world. with that money i mean like how are who are they are, can they blame someone about this money that they're losing or the the costs being raised that's my question no what i was going to say is um so this brings up things that we i mean whose fault it is and all this and that i mean that's just going to have to be worked out one way or another but that still does not excuse the fact that as a as a importer exporter um, cause there's several factors here as a shipper, let's call it what you need to be doing to, I mean, basically to prepare for something like this. I mean, there's so many people that never, I mean, not people, there's so many entities or companies that do not get cargo insurance. For example, this is a very, very good example as to why you need to have cargo insurance. I mean, who the heck would have even predicted this, right? There's other things we talked about. We went to TPM a few weeks ago, and one of the central themes and one of the biggest themes that they were talking about was supply chain resiliency. So something like this before the pandemic would have been like literally catastrophic. It would have been very, very bad because people were not prepared for something. The pandemic, the, 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 Red Sea incident, you know, the, the, the geopolitical stuff, um, Panama Canal, all of that has made everybody very resilient. And I should say everybody, but it's not obviously true. You know, there's some people that still ignore it, you know, that still don't feel like, ah, I don't really need to plan for something like this. So thank, thanks to, to, to those. I mean, they're bad, you know, of course, you know, all the wars that are going on and disrupting supply chains and the, and, and the Panama Canal and the, and, and the pandemic and all that. Of course, those are all bad, but they also actually help companies be more resilient in their supply chain. So that's the other thing. If you, if this is going to catch you off guard, it's kind of your own fault. I'm going to say, you know, I'm not going to, and I don't want to judge or, or say anything really bad about anybody, but honestly, you should have already had a, 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 some kind of plan. You should be more resilient. And from all indications are 
that this, yeah, would have been a major disruption, but at this point, it doesn't look like it's going to be a big deal. I mean, it is going to be a big deal. I'm, I'm, uh, let, let me not lighten it up too much, you know, but what I'm going to say is that it's not going to disrupt it as bad as it, as it would have been have supply chains have or companies have not been prepared for something like this. Interesting. And I guess everyone in that is affected has to look into that. I think insurance is probably something that they need to be looking at every year, which um, I feel like compliance comes in. But yeah, with that being said, this is a very tragic event. And we're thinking of everyone that's impacted because not only, you know, the, the supply chains, obviously, that's the last thing I would think of there. There's people that lost their lives because of this. So Definitely, we're thinking of those people, and uh, we hope that, you know. Well, let me say this, Anna, because you bring up something that's really good there, too. And again, our condolences to the the families and the people involved and and all of this. But the captain of the ship and and the ship, you know, they were, they put out the mayday calls. And I got to say, the personnel on the bridge, they only, the, the first responders, police, I don't know whoever was involved with that. They only had 90 seconds to try and do something. And if you look at the the video, I got to say, they did a great job. There was a lot of traffic trucks and cars going across that bridge before it got hit. But they were able to stop the traffic pretty much. And it's my understanding that the unfortunate is six people missing and, and presumed dead. They have recovered two, the bodies of two people that were workers repairing potholes on the bridge and apparently they had jumped in their truck and were trying to get out and they discovered that truck was uh, in 25 feet of water underneath it fell and uh, and so it fell 185 feet and then went another 25 feet underwater as far as that particular truck i don't know about the other four they're still looking for it but again to the credit of the all involved that it could have been much, much worse based on what I was seeing. So kudos to the, the Baltimore folks responding so quickly. Yeah, that's a very tragic story. Coming to an end now, we're moving on to another tragic story, but not, you know, not to that extent, a little bit differently. So there was implications of, you. well, there's U.S. sanctions on a Chinese cyber, I don't, this word is going to really get me, Spionage? 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 How do you say it? Cyber espionage. Cyber espionage. I've never said that well in English. Cyber espionage firm. So the United States imposed sanctions on a Chinese cyber espionage firm. Basically, they were accusing it of hacking into the U.S. energy industry. So they targeted key sectors such as energy, steel, and apparel, compromising the security of U.S. companies and potentially acquiring valuable trade secrets, which they always do, I feel like. But yeah, there's another U.S. sanctions. That's, you know, as if we don't have enough. But one of the things is, like, how can these companies collaborate with government agencies or, you know, international organizations to to strengthen cybersecurity measures and ensure, like, how do you say it? The integrity of the ports. Well, it's a good point. Too. And we had on Amy Strauss recently, if you will, and forgot the other gentleman that was on with us. But in talking about that very thing, this is one that Customs, the Department of Homeland Security, and several other agencies have been warning us against. And this particular article you reference talks about the U.S. and the U.K., have both filed charges against several Chinese companies and people, and there have been some sanctions in there that has that millions of people, their data and information have been compromised in this deal. So the, the situation is, is that, the, I mean, emails, phone records, personal information, uh, personal account information, all kinds of stuff going on. That this information has been, if you will, hacked and and been stored and and extracted, whatever, and it's been it's gone back to the Chinese government, and of course the Chinese government are saying no, this is a fallacy or whatever. But yet it's folks, this is going on. This is not something that 
you know, again, you go back and there's the controversy over TikTok and things of that nature. Folks, this is a scenario here where we have a country that is playing hardball and playing it uh, very in a dirty manner. I mean, they are not playing well in this. We've yet to see what the overall impact will be of some of these things. Yes, you hear about cybersecurity issues and going on, but there's still a lot to, to be had here on some detrimental things uh, in the future, I think. Yeah. So well, with regards to this story, I feel that about the only things are just like, what are there some key takeaways that companies should be doing and being prepared for? Again, I'm just looking at more like the trade aspect of it and, and what companies may or should be doing. Very obviously, you know, just lock down and enhance your security, your cybersecurity measures. You know, just implement like security protocols, for example, like multi-layer cybersecurity defenses, you know, like firewalls and, and, and like detection systems, you know, like encryption and stuff like that, uh, should be set up within your company so that it could at least, I mean, it may not prevent an attack, but it will at least slow it down or or, or help you identify it and, and recover from it quickly. And of course, because this changes so much and so quickly, my opinion is you need to be continuously assessing your, your risk, you know, and, 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 and assessing your, your security within your company just to make sure that you're up to date or, or that things are, are, are intact so that you're not vulnerable, for example. How often you should do that? I don't know. I mean, I guess you should be doing that periodically. I mean, maybe at least once a year. I mean, but I feel that maybe because things change so quickly, I would say maybe at least twice a year, you know? So the other important thing, I think is probably the most important thing is to be training your, 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 your employees. I mean, they're the front lines, you know, don't be clicking on things on your email that you shouldn't be clicking on, right? I mean, just train them. I mean, training, training, training. Of course, we, we, we basically say that. But so anyway, that is probably the most important thing as well, you know, just to make sure that your employees are aware that they have the idea and the, uh, information on making sure that you are going to be able to have them avoid doing silly things like clicking on emails that they shouldn't be doing, et cetera, you know, and, and reporting things, you know, Hey, I saw this, you know, maybe you should look into this, et cetera. You know, so I just think those are the, the things that at least a couple of things that people companies should be doing for right now. Okay. Yeah. I think that's a good point. And that we can probably move on to the next article. Great. So the next one we have. So it seems that trade is kind of shifting, well, to, towards the East Coast. And it seems that the East Coast is a prominent gateway nowadays. And there's a few shifts happening. So how can the supply chain, like, prepare for something like this like for such a shift because i know s certain supply chains have certain routes they like to use and if you know if logistics or supply chains are shifting and things are getting trick tricky like how you know in the whole how how was that in with those pirates that happened where the pirates were taking over the ships where was that again was right like in Somalia and also in the Red Sea. Yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. So, yeah. so like when those kind of things are happening, how, you know, how easy is it for them to shift or what can they do? Well, let me see. So, so the article was mostly talking about Asia, um, yeah. ship, shipping routes and like trend moving cargo instead of it being traditionally being coming in or moving in from the west coast no 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 from the west coast now they're moving and coming in from the east coast so so like apparently the trade route have been shifting from from you know one coast to the other so that's the main thing that this article was talking about i guess it's just 
where traditionally the the trade routes were were dominated by the west coast now it seems to be more of a trend to going to the east coast yeah yeah i noticed i you know when i hear when i read supply chain disruptions i ultimately think of like all those things that are going on but obviously there can probably be many more factors to that as of better ma- your material or you know strategic advantages do you think companies should diversify or depend on only a single source market? Like what what do you think is best for companies like in this market industry right now? Definitely diversify. I mean, it, it, even I think some of the disruptions like the Baltimore scenario or some of the others, uh, because companies have started looking at different sources than just one. They're able to respond and get back up and running faster. So they have resiliency in their supply chain. They're able to bounce back faster. So definitely you're better off to diversify. Even if you've got a single product, having more than one location manufacturing that product gives you flexibility. Okay. I, very I, yeah i agree i mean i feel like diversifying is always a good like whether it's as a person to diversify or you know in the supply chain i i think it makes sense so that concludes our articles for this news roundup but i do have a fun fact for you guys since it was easter or is easter wherever you are and um, i have a few facts that are interesting they're not quite supply chain facts but they are kind of fun to know First off, Easter is the second biggest candy eating occasion in the USA. Yes, I'm saying in the USA. I don't think it is here, to be honest. We don't eat a lot of candy. All we do here is we eat the chocolate bunnies because also they originated in Germany. So way back then, I love them. They're so yummy. Anyways, I have another one. So 90 million chocolate Easter bunnies are produced annually in the USA which is lots, and 700 million peeps are made, yeah, 700 million peeps are made in the U.S. every year. I do not like peeps. So not I'm not good. a peep fan, but there's a lot then, of people who love peeps. I know, but oh, yeah. it's not a thing here, really, but I know in the United States it is. And 66% of Americans prefer solid chocolate bunnies to hollow ones. And most agree that the correct way to eat them first is ears first. I like the hollow ones. Do you? I guess I'm 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 different because I'm not part of those sixty six percent. Listen, they used to be solid. There was no question about it. And then they got to the point where, you know, they made the hollow ones. You thought that you were getting a solid one. You made the hollow ones, and like, are you kidding? They were saving money. Is what it was, so. I think the hollow ones are much better. You eat less chocolate and they're still so good and they're they're cute. Anyways, also 16 billion jelly beans are made for Easter annually in the United States. That's just crazy. 16 billion jelly beans. Okay. Anyways, I never even heard of jelly beans before I left this country, which is hilarious. Oh and my gosh. That jelly beans are so good. <laughs> so good. Wait, they used, we used to play this game. They have this game of jelly beans, which is like guess the jelly bean. And some of them were gross. And you had to close your eyes and you had to eat one. And then you had to guess. And some of them, literally, they were like two of the, like it could be like gum or it could be something that tastes really disgusting. I don't know if you guys have played that, but it, it was so fun. Yeah, so that is it. Wishing you again a happy Easter. Thanks for listening. Tune in next week. And it, yes. Well, I have another fact for you. So... Do you ever or have you ever wondered why they relate or correlate the Easter bunny with eggs? Like, isn't it that strange? Like, why not a chicken with eggs or, you know what I mean? Well, oh, wait, (laughs) I was going to say because a bunny makes eggs. (laughs) Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let me, let me, let me. Okay. So, So a long time ago, little fun fact. In Germany, there used to be this really rare breed of rabbits that actually did lay eggs. Really? You know that? There's no yeah. way. I don't believe that. Yeah. Really? It's a, but this is like hundreds of years ago. It doesn't exist anymore. I wonder why. So that's why they, 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 they related the, the Easter bunny with eggs. 
Wow, that's right, so say interesting. That one more time for me. I, it, it, I, I, I guess I missed it. Say it one more time, Lalo, that they were, it was a backup. There used to be a breed, I mean, hundreds of years ago. I mean, they don't, it's a breed of rabbits that actually laid eggs. Wow. That's crazy. I'd never heard of that that's one. Wild. It's kind of like a platypus. Okay, but wait, <laughs> yeah, like a platypus. But however, what I just said is also pretty much the other thing we're celebrating today, which is April Fool's Day. So, <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> why is it April that's, Fool's? It's not even April. April first. Yes, April first. Today, today is April first. That's it. Today is today not today is April first. Yes, it is. Today is April first. When the show airs, today is April first. Oh yeah. my god. <laughs> Wow, you got me, Lalo. I literally believed you. (laughs) I'm too gullible for this. Wow, that's hilarious. Yeah, definitely. That's good. That's good. Okay, (laughs) well, on that note, I am April Fool's and happy April Fool's Day. So, great. (laughs) Okay, bye. (laughs) Gotta go now. Thank you very much for joining us. Simply Trade is brought to you by the generous contributions of Global Training Center. You can follow the show and GTC on LinkedIn or Twitter and other social networks. Make sure you check out the show notes in the description for a full rundown of today's show with all the important links. Also, make sure that you share this with a friend and subscribe on your favorite streaming platform. We really like hearing from you. If you enjoyed the show, make sure to rate and review wherever you listen to this podcast. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest in the show or would like to sponsor Simply Trade or suggest any topic you would like for us to discuss, please contact us via email at simplytrade at globaltrainingcenter.com or you can DM us on Twitter at simplytradepod. Thank you again for the privilege of your time. Happy trading. Simply Trade is not a law firm or an advisor. The topics and discussions conducted by Simply Trade hosts and guests should not be considered and is not intended to substitute legal advice. You should seek appropriate counsel for your own situations. These conversations and information are directed towards listeners in the United States for informational, educational, and entertainment purposes only and should not be substituted for legal advice. No listener or viewer of this podcast should act or refrain from acting on the basis of information on this podcast without first seeking legal advice from counsel. Information on this podcast may not be up to date depending on the time of publishing and the time of viewership. The content of this posting is provided as is. No representations are made that the content is error free. The views expressed in or through this podcast are those of the individual speakers, not those of their respective employers or Global Training Center as a whole. All liability with respect to actions taken or not taken based on the contents of this podcast are hereby expressly disclaimed.